happy, 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 happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Happy, 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 happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Where do these happy people come from? Jesus. Where do these happy people come from? These happy people come from Jesus every day, that's all he pleases, that's where these happy people come from. Happy, 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 happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Happy, 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 happy is the people. Good morning whose God is the Lord. Happy, 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 happy. Happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Happy, 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 happy. Happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Hey, Delphine, Margaret Ann, Dave. Did you get Dave up? <laughs> nice to see you guys this morning. Trying to get all my stuff put together here. I uh, had my computer crash, and so I have been doing nothing but computer fixing along with sermon writing for all these last days. And... Uh, um, somebody has got to help me. Someone gave me this yesterday. Put it up close. Uh, and we don't know who. There was no card. Just it was on the doorstep out front with my name on it. And it's amazing. It also weighs about at least eight pounds. And, uh, it's made out of uh, railway spikes and somebody who really knows a welder. Look, look at how they melted the molten metal down around the bottom. Somebody gave us this as our Easter gift and uh, uh, how amazing is that? They even drilled the holes where the nails went in into the metal. Someone did an amazingly beautiful job. What a, what a treasure. Thank you, whoever gave me this. Thank you so much. I sure wish you'd tell me who you are uh, so I could say thank you to you. But thank you. Happy Easter. Happy Easter, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin in two minutes. And uh, so until then, I, I don't have anything for you really to follow. I, uh, um, I think I, yes, this is the right one. Um, the, uh, the lessons today are, hey, Cindy Ocri. Hi, Cindy. Haven't seen you for many, many years. Nice of you to plug in this morning. And Andrea, nice to see you this morning. Um, our gospel lessons, if you want to get out your... Good morning, Norm and Rosella, uh, Donna and Orville. Nice to see you guys are watching. And Andrea, nice to see that you're watching. We sure do appreciate it. And uh, uh, I wanted to give you the Bible verses so you could look them up, uh, have your Bibles ready. So get out a pen and paper, if you would, and, and write this down. Uh, Valerie will be reading the parts of the congregation, and uh, um, I wish you all had a copy of this. I, I don't know how I could have done that. I actually, you know, I could have emailed everybody a copy of this, um, but I but I didn't. I, I should have. I should have done that, because I, I have all your emails. I know a lot of you who are going to be watching, I could have done that. Oh, that was foolish. I don't know why I didn't. But Anyways, okay, here are the readings, if you have a pen, uh, from Acts 10, 34 through 43. Acts 10, 34 through 43. Hey, Tara. 
and Don and Kay, Doris, Doris, hey, Doris was my church secretary at Radisson. Marilyn, nice to see you all, Lyle. Happy Easter to all of you too. Um, and then the second verse is from Matthew 28, 1 through 10. 28, 1 through 10. And the first is Acts 10, 34 through 43. And uh, we don't have much in the way of hymns. I just, I have one minute left here. Uh, my sister sent me something. Uh, and uh, I don't remember how she sent it to me. Yeah, I think it's. I think the only way I can get this, uh, Susan sent me a, a, a her singing, but I think she sent it on. I'm pretty sure she didn't send it on Messenger. Oh shoot, match! I should have had this ready. No, I don't have it. Oh, that's too bad. Maybe if you could get out your uh, hymnals that you have at home. Um, oh, for goodness sakes. I'm having trouble here this morning. So much for not touching your face. I've... Well, let us begin. So nice of you to uh, join us at seven in the morning. <clears throat> when I uh, came out of the house this morning and I breathed in the cold air, uh, bring that down a bit. When I breathed in the cold air, I thought to myself, I wonder what Jesus's first breath was like uh, when he was resurrected from the dead and the body was laying there dead and all of a sudden there was a <gasps> I wonder what that was like. <laughs> Have you ever thought of that? His body was all of a sudden there was a <gasps> and he was breathing and it was a garden. <clears throat> so when he walked out of the tomb uh, the air would have been sweet with flowers and plants and oh the smell would have been unbelievably beautiful there in Israel the gardens are so beautiful so fragrant and uh, and he walked out um, and the stone was rolled away and remember he didn't have to roll the stone away he simply could have walked out um, but he rolled the stone away so we could look in and so that we could see what was inside and uh, yes, my cousin Delphine just reminded us it's six o'clock out there. <laughs> all the better for you. <laughs> Glad you're with us. Um, Oliver and Donna, nice to see you guys. Angela, welcome. Ashley, welcome to you. Um, Jesus' first breath, what was it like? I, maybe one day we'll be able to ask him. Let's, let's sing together. Christ the Lord is risen today, Alleluia. Christians hasten on your way, Alleluia. Offer praise with love, we please. <laughs> I started too high. Alleluia. At the Paschal's victim's feet, Alleluia. Can you ever 
sing that song without thinking of King of Kings. <clears throat> and our last scene uh, of the show, every night, we would sing that song together. Oh, how much fun that was. I miss all of you who were part of that. We had so much fun doing that. So many years uh, we did it. It was the center of our lives in, in uh, Dixon, and uh, miss that. Uh, Annie has recently wanted to see videos of it, and uh, so I've started looking for videos. But we will do our service, and Valerie will do the congregation's part. And um, uh, just so that you can hear her, I'm going to ask her to sit a little closer here. Um, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us glorify the Lord. For all of God's goodness to us. Good people, what do you know? He is risen from the tomb. Hallelujah. Who's risen from the tomb? God's own Son, the Chosen One. The Christ is risen from the tomb. Hallelujah. When did he die? Last Friday, about three o'clock in the afternoon. What was the cause of his death? Crucifixion, loss of blood, suffocation, a broken heart, abandonment, an overdose of our lack of love. How do you know that this Christ is risen from the tomb? Mary Magdalene told Peter and John, and they told the other disciples, and the disciples told the church, and the church told us. What does all this have to do with you? By our baptism, we are part of Christ. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Then you were once dead? We were dead as doornails. Dead in hate. Dead in sin and selfishness. Dead in apathy. Dead in sorrow. Dead in pain. And now you're risen from the tomb? We are alive forevermore. We have come to newness of life. Hallelujah. Does this mean you'll never again hurt or hate? It means our sadness and hatred and pain will never again defeat us. It means that the victory is also assured. Are you celebrating this victory today at this hour? Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. So what kind of mood are you in? Joyful, excited, happy mood. Then why aren't you smiling? It's hard to smile and read at the same time. <laughs> How do you express your joy? By singing, praying, communing, and being fed by God's presence in Christ. How else do you express your joy? By cheerfully answering your questions. May we ask you some questions? Sure, go ahead. What does Easter mean to you? It means that whatever power within me or around me that would defeat God's purpose for me is now itself defeated. What else does Easter mean? It means that God's rule has begun anew that God's chosen Messiah has arrived, that sin and death have been defeated, that evil is on its way out, that the Christ lives and reigns, and that his reign is always reason for hope, that my eternal relationship with God has begun and can be daily renewed. What can we do to keep Easter going all year round? Live and love and hope and live in love. What does that mean? It means to be ready and willing to love and serve one another, to receive another's love and sacrifice, and to live with the hope that whatever darkness we encounter, God's loving light has another word. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's, let's try our song. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Now you all know this. So guys, join in with me and girls, you're with Valerie. Ready? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. <laughs> I can't ever get it right. Okay. We continue. Let us pray. Lord God, we gather in the name of the risen Christ 
to pour forth our praises in glad Easter celebration. We rejoice that you have not left us without hope, but have come back to us in the victory of the resurrection and given us the assurance of eternal life with him who you lit with him with whom you lifted from the tomb. Praise be your name, both now and forevermore. Amen. Do you want to do the first reading? Could you do that? The first reading is from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judah and in Jerusalem. And they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. From Matthew 28, 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee where they will see me. This is the gospel of our risen Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the thing that always gives me so much confidence uh, in the scriptures are little things like he rolled back the stone and then sat upon it. Who would write that if it wasn't true? I mean, if I was writing a story, if I was making this up, why on earth would I add he sat upon it? If, if it isn't true, who would have come up with that? Nobody. And so the fact that he says that, you know, that the scriptures say that. He, he rolled back the stone and the angel sat upon it. That just gives me such confidence because how could it not be true writing something like that 2,000 years ago? It, it wasn't a, a group of geniuses who got together who put this together. This was, this was an eyewitness testimony. And this is what they wrote. Tremendous confidence in what the scriptures say. You probably don't remember the name. Uh, some of you from Dixon probably do because I used this message, uh, th this story many times for many messages. Um, but the name uh, Nikolai Ivanovich Burkharin. Uh, during his day, he was a powerful man, perhaps as powerful as any man who has ever been on earth. He was a Russian communist leader who took part in the Bolshevik Revolution in, in 1917. 
He was editor of the Soviet newspaper Pravda, and which means truth, <laughs> right? And was a full member of the Politburo. His work on economics and political science are still read today. And there is a story about a journey he took from Moscow to, to Kiev in 1930 to address a huge assembly on the subject of atheism. Addressing the crowd, he aimed his heavy artillery at Christianity. He hurled one insult after another at Christians there gathered. He argued against it. He showed proof against it. He told everyone how foolish and how stupid people were who believed in such trite. And an hour later, it took a whole hour, he was finished. He looked out at what seemed to be the smoldering ashes of men's faith. Are there any questions? He cried out. Burke Heron, Burke Heron stood there on the stage crying and deafening silence filled the auditorium. But then one man approached the platform and mounted the lectern. And standing near the communist leader, he surveyed the crowd first to the left and then to the right and finally he shouted out, Christ is risen! And en masse, the whole crowd cried out, He is risen indeed! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! I say these words to you this morning. I am convinced I have faith that Christ was dead, dead as a doornail, that he was buried, and I believe that he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead again to glory. This Easter, as I sit here in my office and proclaim this word to you, I cannot begin to tell you how much these words define who I am and probably define who you are. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. How many apostles were there? There were 12, right? Matthew lists their names. There were the big names like Peter and James and John. And there was the bad apple, Judas. There was the doubter, Thomas, who really wasn't much of a doubter. It's just we've given him that title. Too bad, Thomas. Uh, there was the tax collector, Matthew. There were seven, several who we know practically nothing about. Uh, quite a motley crew when you put them all together, actually. There was nobody there that was a standout of any kind. But Jesus chose these twelve to be his apostles. He picked them. He knew who they would be long before they were born. They traveled with him while he was alive, and after his death, he turned over the whole thing to them. He put all of his trust in these 11 men, and none of them were geniuses. None of them were particularly amazing people, at least not yet, but they became amazing. They shaped the whole Western world. Everything changed because of them. Whether it's our art, our literature, our politics, everything. Everything changed because of Jesus. It always amazes me when you have these lists of who the most influential person in history was and some doughhead will write down Elvis. Or some doughhead will write down, you know, John from the Beatles as the most influential, or Wayne Gretzky, or something of the equal silly sort. Jesus Christ changed everything, right down to the way we think. Everything changed because of Jesus. Now, there weren't always 12 disciples. For a while, there were actually close to 500, but then when Jesus has the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he starts talking about taking up your cross and following me and all the sacrifice discussion 
and he gets really owly that last week. Uh, he's, he's cursing fig trees and Pharisees and everything else, and he's mad. He's mad at people who are sinning and so on, and, and he turns on all these disciples and, and says, if you don't take up your cross and follow me, and, and well, they all fall away. They, they, they quit. We've had enough of this nonsense, and so they're out. And so later on, there is another uh, disciple chosen, and of course that is Matthias. And so again, we have 12. But when you think of it, you got to include Paul in that group, and then you have to throw in Barnabas because, well, Paul and Barnabas were synonymous with Acts, and they were apostles. And so then uh, Paul says that James, the Lord's brother, is an apostle in Galatians, and so now we have 15. And, you know, I cannot uh, look at all of this without including Mary Magdalene. Uh, she is what is called an isapostolos, an isapostolos. And it's, what it means is that it's equal to an apostle. Mary had been with Jesus from the very beginning, and she was the first witness of the resurrection, the first to see the risen Christ, and she was the first to be given a commission. So she is an Estapostolus, and, and when he says, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, and your Father, to my God, and your God, and who does he send to do that? He sends a woman. He sends Mary. And I never, ever can get out of my head the words of scripture that say neither Greek, uh, n neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female. Neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female. To Jesus, I don't believe it matters a who. Whether you're a man or a woman. And uh, he says the same here. He, he shows the same. Who is it that it comes to the tomb and discovers the tomb? It isn't a man. It's Mary. And we might think that it's a patriarchal society, a, a, a man's world, and it's true. Jesus did pick nothing but men for his disciples, but in the end, it's Mary who finds the empty tomb. It's important to remember Mary's story on Easter because Easter is about God taking a hopeless situation and turning it around. It's about God taking the Christ crucified, dead in the ground, and Satan sitting on top of him, happy as can be with himself that he's gotten rid of this, this upstart Jesus Christ, and God turning around and bouncing Satan off right onto his ear, and Jesus standing up and looking down at him and asking what he's doing there. He took a hopeless situation and he turned it around. He took her hopeless situation, Mary's, and turned it around. And that's what God did on Easter. A hopeless situation. A dead man, a corpse. And he turned it around. That man sat up and walked out of there. So on that first Easter, Jesus chose Mary Magdalene, one of the many hopeless people whom Jesus had helped to take word to the disciples who had given up hope. They no longer had to bother with hope. They were all locked away, afraid of what was coming. Perhaps a little bit like we are right now with this virus. I've been thinking that all week long, that those disciples locked away in that room are not a whole lot different than we are now He locked away in our rooms, sitting and waiting, writing sermons. <laughs> Hope is the expectation that something good will happen. Jesus sent Mary to the disciples with the amazing news. And then he turns to them and he says, So I send you. And that was the beginning. Those few unimpressive disciples, empowered by the Holy Spirit, were to take the message of the risen Christ to the rest of the world. They were to spread the word of the risen Christ to all those places that we find so difficult to pronounce. There was Parthia and Phrygia and Pamphylia that are all spelled nothing like they sound. And they were to spread their word to Egypt and Rome. And later, the disciples went 
all over the world. They went to Europe and England and Scotland and Ireland and the Americas and Korea and Australia and New Zealand and Fiji and South Africa and Zimbabwe and Nippowin and Dixon and Radisson and Mastatum and Hudson Bay and Melfort and Langham and all the other places. The disciples of the Lord have gone everywhere. In some places and sometimes tyrants have tried to stomp it out. They've tried to stomp us out. But it hasn't worked. Back in the day when uh, we didn't know about how deadly mercury could be, we used to play with mercury at school. I, I remember very much we'd pour mercury into the palm of our hands and play with it. It was cool. I mean, it was fun to play with mercury. And who knew it was, you know, killing us. But nonetheless, we played with mercury. And the thing about mercury is that the more pressure you put down on it, the more you pushed on it, it would squirt out. And instead of having one lump, now you'd have a hundred little balls of mercury flying everywhere all over your desk. Oh, it was fun to play with mercury. I think of that every time I re read or think about the gospel message being taken out by the disciples. You know, these tyrants, they'd try to push down on the disciples. They'd try to stomp them out. And as soon as they'd put pressure on those disciples, they would squirt out from under. And now there'd be a hundred instead of one. And these tyrants began to learn that you can't just, you know, go after them straight on because they multiply when you do that. <laughs> and, and we do. We multiply when, when they do that. The faith is still spreading today. It's still spreading today. And there's plenty of room to keep it spreading. In our own community, there are many people living quiet lives of desperation, to coin a phrase. Some are trying to put a spark in their lives by using alcohol or drugs I've been speaking now for the past two weeks about that hole in our hearts that is in the shape of Jesus and nothing else we try to jam in that hole will fill it perfectly. And so you can you know, try to push a bottle into that hole, it's not going to work. You can try to push a syringe into that hole, it's just not going to get you there. Some are trying to feel good about themselves by buying a bigger house or maybe they're trying to buy a new car something that'll make them feel more important, something better. But of course, when they get that thing, and it's just a thing, they find that it's empty, that it's meaningless. Selling their souls for a chance to accumulate wealth. Many wonder if anyone loves them, and the answer is all too often that no one does, that many don't even know they exist. You know, you can multiply that times 10,000 and get an idea of the scope of the problem in this nation and all the nations of the world. You can multiply it by a million and get the idea of the kind of desperation that exists in our continent. As Jesus said in another context, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And so Jesus said to Mary, go to my brothers start spreading the word. And so Jesus said to those first disciples, the ones hidden in that locked room, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Start spreading the word. And Jesus says to you this morning, as the Father sent me, I send you. Folks, he's sending you this morning. Now we can't go very far because our doors are locked, but we have telephones and we can communicate. So Jesus says to us, I send you. And this morning he says to you, pick up your phones. Phone your neighbor. Tell them about me. Phone your relatives. Tell them about me. Tell them, me, tell them about your faith. How amazing it is. Those disciples eventually came out of their locked rooms and began preaching wherever they could find a synagogue or a soapbox but their voices have long since been stilled. Now it's our turn. It's your turn. Where does Jesus want us to go? To 
tell this resurrection story on this Easter morning? The answer is going to be different for each one of you. Each one of you will be given orders, will be given direction. All you have to do is pray and ask. Pray and ask. And he'll tell you where to go, who to speak to. He'll put people in your way, in your path. When someone unexpectedly comes into my life, the first thing that comes to my mind now is, what does the Lord want me to do with this person? Who, who is this person? What, why, why is he here? What does the Lord want from me with this person? And it, it's always the case. It's always the case that he puts someone in my way. When I was in Dixon, we had an amazing outreach program. We started a food bank, and uh, we fed a number of families, and we did prison ministry. Uh, I taught the Alpha program, and a number of men joined me weekly, going to the prison in Borden to teach Alpha. And we gave help to individuals, uh, and we sent some of our members to Africa to help build a church there, to share the love of Christ. And we sent some of our members north, uh, up into the far, far north, to help a, a congregation way up there. The Lord sends different people to different places for different reasons. But he sends us. All you have to do is ask the question, where do I go? What do you want me to do? It's only... As, as grand as you want it to be and as small as you are unwilling to make it. We can do amazing things as a little church. All we have to do is reach out in faith. I'll never forget when we sent our members to Africa, the amazing joy when they returned and showed us pictures to the fellows who went up into the far north, the stories they had, how amazing. Do you know that the prison uh, ministry that we did ended up with me baptizing three men and, and marrying one to a woman <laughs> and marrying uh, a couple that were, uh, his wife was, uh, the woman was outside and they brought her into the church or the prison chapel for the wedding. Amazing what came of that prison ministry. But that's the stuff of Christ. As soon as you start sowing seeds, you have a crop. And before long, you have a harvest. That's the stuff of Jesus. Remember that helping people in need is a witness to Christ. And it's a universal order from Jesus. It's, it's not a suggestion. We must, as Christians, reach out. And there's a thousand different ways that you can spend, spread the Easter message. Let me conclude with this story. Uh, in his book, Sources of Strength, Jimmy Carter tells about a Cuban pastor uh, named Eloy Cruz. And he observed that Cruz seemed to have a special touch with poor immigrants. And so Carter saw Cruz connect with person after person. He always had the right word to say, just the right touch. Invariably, people walked away from their encounter with Pastor Cruz just a little stronger, just a little more hopeful, just a little better prepared to face life's challenges. And Carter asked Cruz the secret of his success. And at first Cruz was embarrassed, but then he thought for a moment and was able to answer. He said this. He said, Senor Jimmy, <laughs> we only need to have two loves in our life for God and for the person who happens to be in front of us. I love that. Two loves for God and whatever person is in front of you. That's what we're called to. Easter is the story of God's love for us. We'll be able to spread that Easter story if we will have just two loves in our life a love of God and a love of whoever is in front of us. This Easter, ask God to show us how you can serve. This year, push your churches to reaching out. 
don't just sit in those four walls and keep it all to yourselves. Send it somewhere. Send your people out and share the word of God. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. We thank you, O God, that this night is over, that through the resurrection of Jesus a new day has dawned, a day in which your light dispels even the darkness of death. Grant courage, we pray, this day to those who struggle with pain and suffering, especially those who we mention in our hearts at this time. I pray especially today for Lois, who lost her husband this past week, um, for George Campbell in Melfort. I pray for him. And a very special prayer this morning uh, for Bob Smith. Um, Bob is the brother of uh, uh, Doug and uh, Mrs. Ryan, and, and uh, Bob has cancer, and he is struggling very much with that right now. And so we remember Bob in our prayers. We pray, Lord, that a miracle could happen. Miracles happen. We see them all the time. Let a miracle happen in the life of Bob and George. Let a miracle happen in Lois's life. That she would come to know you closer because of this terrible loss that she has had. Be with Lottie and the Smith family as they try to reach out and support her son, their brother, Go ahead, Valerie. Give strength to those who seek justice and resist evil, even to the point of death. Grant them the vision of your eternal kingdom and show to them in their bodies and in their souls the victory that Christ has won for them and for all of his faithful servants. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father, we thank you that we are not alone, that you are present and work in us as you worked in Christ Jesus to reconcile and make new all who live in your world. Help us to always share the peace and to know through him with, and, and sh share the peace that we know through him with those who are in conflict. To pour out your love upon those who are lonely and afraid and to share the bounty you have granted us with those who are in need. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Gracious Father, we pray to you this day that you would make our praise a matter of both word and of action, and that our faith, being established by the truth of Christ's resurrection, might result in new life within us, and in glory and honor always being ascribed to thee. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and forever. Amen. We thank thee, O God, for the life and the hope that you have given us. Watch over us. Make us the people who you want us to be. Through Christ, our risen Savior. Amen. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. I got a message last night that they are asking the churches, because we are not in church, to ring our church bells at 9 a.m.
9 a.m. sharp. So I hope at Radisson, I was there when the bell tower was put up. I'll never forget it, how much fun we had raising that beautiful bell at uh, Radisson. I hope somebody will go over and ring the bell at 9 o'clock at Radisson, at Langham. I hope someone rings the bell at Dixon. Please, someone ring the bell at 9 a.m. today. Uh, I don't know whether you have a bell you can take out Delphine and ring in Oregon, but uh, if you do, go out and, and ring your bell. Um, and uh, Carrie, you're here. Isn't that cool? Uh, and Jeff, nice to see you. Sherry, welcome. Um, Bernadine, nice to have you here. Um, but please, uh, whatever church you are at or near, uh, please go and make sure that that bell is ringing at 9 a.m. Let's let the world know that we're still here. We might not be meeting and nothing, nothing makes me sadder than not being able to celebrate Holy Communion this morning. Uh, what a hole uh, in our lives that we can't share Holy Communion today. And uh, I, I apologize. I wish we could. I, I've tried to think of ways to do it and it doesn't seem that no matter what I come up with that it it would work. Uh, so we're just going to have to wait. And uh, I can't imagine that the Lord uh, is going to hold it against us. So we will, uh, we will wait. God bless you. Love you all so much. Oh man, we just got a, a blessing, Valerie, from Janet Kurtz in Morrisville, North Carolina. How cool. Thank you, Janet, for Hi, that. Auntie Janet. <laughs> that's, that's Valerie. Oh, this is too cool. Oh, I'm so thankful that you all got up. Fifty-some people got up this morning. Fifty. That's incredible. That's just views. There's probably a hundred of you in total. Thank you so much for sharing with us this morning. I, I hope you have a tremendous day. Uh, I don't want to push things too far, but at 11 o'clock, uh, we have another service, and uh, it's a completely different service. Uh, the service order is different. The sermon is different. Uh, sadly, I'll be the same, but the rest is all going to be different. And uh, so um, thank you again for uh, tuning in. We'll see those of you who uh, would love to. Please join me again at 11 o'clock this morning. And uh, I love all of you, too. Judy, nice to see you here. Um, we'll see you all at 11 o'clock, and then at 8 o'clock tonight, uh, I have yet another service and another sermon for tonight. Um, uh, tonight's message is The Stone Speaks, uh, and uh, we have, uh, uh, in a couple of hours, we have the 11 o'clock service. Please remember, get to your churches, Radisson, Langham, Dixon, Melfort, everywhere, guys, 9 a.m., Make sure our bells in the churches are ringing. Let the world know that we're still here and that, that Christ has risen. Love you all. Love you all. Uh, see you at 11 o'clock. Crystal, see you at 11. Susan, love you all. Bye-bye.